I guess right now the main battle seems to be over Bain Capital. You were critical of Bain Capital in the primary process. Now the president's being critical of Bain Capital. How, how, how many voters do you think are really going to be swayed by that at the end of the year, uh, come November? You know, I actually think, ironically, this is going to be a big vote loser for the president because it gets him right in the middle of a job-creating economic fight. When, uh, and I listen to Governor uh, Deval Patrick, and, and when, you, <clears throat> when you really look at Massachusetts, when Romney left, it was 4.7% unemployment rate, which if you had that today would be about 5.5 million more Americans at work. So every day that the president gets involved in an economic fight, He's on exactly the turf Romney wants to campaign on, because if the issue is going to be the longest period of unemployment since the Great Depression, the highest price of gasoline in American history, the largest deficits in American history, I don't see how the president wins. He's actually better off uh, to, to campaign on as many distractions as possible and hope people don't quite get back around to the economy. Speaking of distractions, Donnie Deutsch yeah. is here, and he has a question. Mr. Donnie. S- Mr. Speaker, you're, you're obviously a very passionate man. And we could play hours and hours of clips of you on the campaign trail against Mr. Romney. As a human being, how hard is it now? Because one thing that is great about you, and I I probably disagree with about everything you stand for politically, but I respect your passion, your conviction. You've got to come out now and stump for a guy that it seemed like you clearly didn't like. And and you were you actually loathed. And now you've got to come on and, and, you know, I'm a surrogate. So that's got to be tough just from a human point of view. Well, look, now, we had a very tough primary season. Uh, I threw the kitchen sink at him. He threw a bigger kitchen sink at me. Uh, it wasn't fun, and, and some of it was personal. There's no question about it. But Barack Obama makes this really easy. If you, if you ask me on behalf of my grandchildren, who are 10 and 12, uh, what do I think should happen this November? I believe so deeply that Mitt Romney should be elected and that Barack Obama's second term would be a disaster for the country, that it's very easy for me uh, to stump for the governor and to advocate for the governor, because I, I do honestly believe that a second Obama term will be a genuine disaster for the United States. So I think that's, you know, if, if, if it's a different environment, if you said to me in a primary setting, uh, is, is Mitt Romney going to be my first choice? The answer would be no. But he is the Republican party's nominee. That's definitive after Tuesday night. He's not presumptive anymore. He has the votes. He'll be the nominee. <clears throat> I am a party loyalist. I've been active since uh, 1960 in building the Georgia GOP from literally nothing uh, to now controlling every major aspect of Georgia politics. Uh, and I really believe in uh, a, a conservative approach to America's future, and I really am worried about the cost to America of a second term for Obama. So it's pretty easy for me to be enthusiastic. You're a historian, uh, Newt. Let's talk about uh, the history of this campaign really briefly, because Donnie, <laughs> Donnie just used asked you a question. You talked about a kitchen sink being thrown at you. It's very interesting. We were talking to Bob Livingston. I was talking to Bob yesterday on the phone, and we both agreed that but for the third party attack ads against you in Iowa in December when you were surging into first place and then you recover and you win South Carolina and you go to Florida and another slew of unprecedented third party attack ads against you I think we both agreed but for those two attacks uh, you could you could actually be in Romney's position right now Do we need to fix a system that distorts a primary process as much as the super PAC process distorted this primary system? It's ironic that McCain, Feingold, and the so-called reforms that preceded it have all crippled middle-class candidates, have all empowered the very rich, uh, have all made the system worse, have all given lawyers and accountants a huge amount of jobs. Um, We'd be so much better off with a very simple system that said... Any American can donate any amount of personal income after taxes as long as they report it online that night and they will give it to the candidate. Uh, And then the candidates would would have to be responsible for the advertising. You'd have a cleaner, more positive, uh, healthier system. I think uh, you watch this fall. The, The... between the Obama super PACs, the Romney super PACs, the conservative super PACs, the liberal super PACs, uh, it's going to be a mess and people are going to be sick of it and it's really unfortunate. It's not the way a great nation should govern itself.
Mr. Speaker, it's Willie Geist. I was going to ask you your favorite big cat, but we can move on from that. <laughs> you can, I'll let you think about that one. Uh, but I want to get specific about policy differences between Mitt Romney and President Obama. We hear all the rhetoric. We hear from one side that Mitt Romney is an unfeeling rich guy. The other side, the president's a socialist. But what specifically, if Mitt Romney were elected president, how would the economy fundamentally change when he gets in office? What policy would he be able to put into place to change the direction of the country? to get people working again? Well, first of all, I think the recovery would start late on election night uh, when small businesses realized that Obamacare was going to be repealed and you'd see employment start back up probably even as early as November and December of this year. Second, the governor himself has said the very first day he's going to sign uh, the Keystone Pipeline to bring Canadian oil through the United States to Houston, creating thousands of new jobs, increasing our energy security. He's also indicated a number of regulations he will eliminate on the very first day. He's taking steps to repeal Obamacare care on the very first day. Uh, I hope he's going to ask the Congress to stay in session on January 3rd and pass a series of bills and have him on his desk the morning he's inaugurated. Uh, I think you're also going to see him appoint some very tough-minded people to the government. You know, when you watch the Fish and Wildlife Service threatening to cripple the largest on land oil and gas uh, area in the United States and West Texas over a, a variation of uh, horn toad. Uh, you have to think that the bureaucracy has lost its mind. Mm. When you go to the Central Valley of California and you see towns with 30 percent unemployment, uh, largely Hispanic, by the way, uh, all of it done by the Fish and Wildlife Service on behalf of a tiny fish in the Sacramento River. Again, you think the bureaucracy has lost its mind. When you look at EPA trying to close down uh, coal burning electri- electric uh, facilities or raise the cost of them dramatically uh, at a time when we want jobs, you have to wonder, you know, these are bureaucrats who obviously have no relationship to the economy. So I think a Romney approach will be less government spending, less government intervention, greater freedom for entrepreneurs, uh, more opportunity for small business, uh, and a real desire to focus on job creation as job number one. Uh, You mentioned repealing Obamacare, and I'll just tag on Willie's question, if I could, in terms of policies that he would put in place. Uh, I'm wondering what, especially in terms of job creation, policies does he stand for, would put in place, that are consistent with his past leadership positions, specifically serving as governor of Massachusetts? Because a lot of people question who he really is and what he stands for and his consistency on policies. Well, I think, first of all, he really is a problem solver, and he tries to be very practical and very pragmatic. Uh, And I think that uh, his approach to the country at large will be very different than his approach as governor of Massachusetts, because Massachusetts is one of the most liberal states in the country, had an 85 percent Democratic legislature, and was in a very different environment. But I know from both campaigning with him, talking with him in private, uh, you know, he's not going to try to take... uh, a Massachusetts health plan to Texas or to Idaho uh, or to Wyoming. He understands this is a big, diverse country. I think he understands it better after two presidential campaigns. And I think as a result, you're going to see a desire to liberate the 50 states and have them each develop. He said this publicly in the debates. Have each of them develop their approaches in ways that fit their economy and their local culture. It's a little bit like watching Kaiser Permanente, which has been very successful in California as an organized doctor system fails in most of the country when they try to move because doctors simply repudiate that model outside of California. So you've you've got to look carefully at a big diverse nation like this may need a series of local solutions rather than one central solution. And and by the way, Mike, that's that has long been the Republican approach. I know in 1994 when we went in there, you had people like Governor Engler and uh, in Michigan, Tommy Thomas in Wisconsin, all trying different things, different experiments on welfare reform, on health care reform, on tax reform. And you know what? What worked in Michigan wouldn't necessarily work in Alabama, wouldn't necessarily work in California. Yeah, well, I think on that issue, Governor Romney would be uh, doing a bit better if he could explain it as articulately as the Speaker did. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, yeah. Mr. Speaker, you're, uh, you're familiar with the world stage, given your years in, in politics. There's been some level of unrest or disagreement with Governor Romney over his contention made a couple of weeks ago that Russia 
is our number one national security issue, our number one problem that we confront on the world stage. A, do you agree with what Governor Romney said? And B, you know, what are your thoughts on what dangers we do face globally? Well, I, I think you just raised a really important question and one that I hope Governor Romney is going to encourage a national discussion about. I, I think we're in a different world. I, I, don't, I don't think we're in a single alternative kind of world. I think we have a huge problem with radical Islamists. I think we have a significant long-term challenge from China. I think Russia is still a significant uh, challenge in some ways. Uh, it certainly has the most nuclear weapons other than the United States. I think it has more than we do right now. Uh, so I think you, we also have to look at, for example, the drug war in Mexico. I, I wrote a newsletter recently uh, on, on uh, the war below our border and, and, and right in our own neighborhood. Uh, the war next door was the title of it. And you, when you look at the number of people killed in Mexico, mm, yeah. uh, we have to be concerned yeah, for geez. our neighbors. And we have to have a real, I think, as a national security issue. If Mexico became a failed state, it would immediately, overnight, become our number one national security concern. I, I, I want to follow up. But talking, Speaking of Mexico, Republicans now find themselves down 30, 40, maybe even 50 points in some polls when you're polling Hispanics. Uh, you were attacked during the primary campaign for striking a, I wouldn't even say a moderate tone, a conservative to moderate tone on immigration reform. Um, Rick Perry uh, was practically run out of the race when he talked about not punishing the children of illegal immigrants in this country. How do the Republican? How does the Republican Party get a candidate out of a primary process when he or she's running for president in a position where he or she can win enough Hispanic votes to win the general election? Because we haven't done a very good job of it this year. Well. First of all, I don't think my position uh, hurt me at all. In fact, I think it helped some because it was a serious concern, a serious effort to try to solve a national problem. I think Senator Marco Rubio will tell you that there is a there's a common sense series of steps we can take uh, that are very attractive to virtually all Americans of all backgrounds. He's working on a bill that's very important that I think will be a, a, a significant part of the conversation this summer. Governor Romney's indicated he's going to work with Senator Rubio on this. You look at somebody like uh, Governor Susana Martinez on the border in New Mexico. Uh, she has a very clear sense uh, as a uh, Latina that, that she can deal with these issues. She can talk to her community. Uh, she can campaign among them and, and she can explain it. I, I think you're going to find a real effort in our part there. But, but remember, if you go and talk to the average uh, Latino American, they're going to tell you they care one about jobs, two about education three about health, and four about the price of gasoline. And they know, and certainly will be reminded all summer and fall by, by Republicans, that Barack Obama broke his word. He said he would solve the immigration problem. He had two full years with a Democratic House, a Democratic Senate. He accomplished nothing. Uh, and he is in no position to go out and say that he is the friend of Latino Americans. Uh, he has hurt them on unemployment. He has hurt them on the price of gasoline. He has hurt them on his failure to reform education. And he has hurt them on his failure to be serious and honest about the complexity of immigration reform. So I think we are going to do much better than people expect by this fall. Uh, and I think you'll see us on, on Univision and on Telemundo and others uh, making a real uh, effort to reach out to every Latino American and say, we want to work with you. And we believe Latinos want work more than promises, and we want to work with you to make sure every person has a job. You know, it, it is so interesting. You talk to Hispanic leaders, and they talk about their concerns about this administration mm -hmm. and what they did not do over the past three years. Um, and the question is whether Mitt Romney, the Republican Party, are going to be in a position to capitalize on that, given some of the rhetoric during the primary campaign. I would challenge the speaker. I don't think you're going to see a lot of media dollars spent against the Hispanic audience by the Republicans. Oh, oh my I will, gosh. I will take that, I'll, I'll take that bet. Yeah, I, I will take that bet, too. Uh, I yeah, think let, fish, let me tell you. where the fish is. Wait, let me tell you something. I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't bet 10000 but, <laughs> but I will put up $10. Let's speak a snake, okay? Speaking of a middle-class candidate, yes, we, we will... Uh, we, we will bet some snakes. You know what the speaker just referenced? I, I find it staggering that the, the news media, and we are part of the news media, have not covered the fact 
that it is safer to live in Baghdad than it is in Ciudad Juarez, it right is. across the Rio Grande it border. It is unbelievable. It's, it's, it's staggering, the, yeah. the, the, the casualties down there. It is. All right, hey, Mr. Speaker, speaker, thank you so much. New King Rich, thank you very much Great for being on the show. Thanks.